Last uh, Wednesday, Brother Richter covered chapters 4 through 11. We were trying to remember how many chapters he covered. It's about eight chapters of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 4 through 11. And we're going to pick up this morning in chapter 12. And we'll kind of be jumping between uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah primarily uh, this morning, just to kind of reconcile the two stories here, where these prophecies are falling in line with our timeline. Brother Waldron has in the book uh, his three columns, as he uh, has been doing up until this point in the book. Uh, kind of hard to follow at this point. Um, I know he he did the best that he could. It's it's not an easy thing to uh, outline. Um, but uh, I'm not going to do the column thing that I did last week because uh, I think it would be a lot more confusing. So uh, hopefully, uh, at least on my slides, you can follow along the flow of the story here and where we're at in our story of captivity and where these prophecies from Ezekiel and Jeremiah are falling in line with the storyline here. So uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 12. The title of our lesson this morning in the book, starting on page 40, is Zedekiah's Captivity Signified. And that's primarily what we're going to be looking at in these chapters, is looking at the fact that they are go Zedekiah is going into captivity, and we're going to be looking at some other prophecies going on during that captivity. Okay, So um, in Ezekiel chapter 12, uh, God tells Ezekiel... Um, to do this sort of odd thing, uh, he tells him to, uh, in verse 2, um, or verse 3, excuse me, he says, Prepare your belongings for captivity, and go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from place to place into captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. By day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight, as though going into captivity. And at evening you shall go in their sight like those who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them <clears throat> excuse me, on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight. You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground, for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So God tells, um, tells Ezekiel to gather up his things, dig through this wall. And the sort of odd part of this commandment, is he tells him to cover his eyes while he's going out of the city. And he wants, to, he wants Ezekiel to make sure that the people are seeing him do this. And he says in verse 9, <clears throat> um, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? God was wanting the people to inquire of this odd thing that Ezekiel was doing. And he says in verse 10, Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel, who are among them. Who's he referring to there when he's talking about the prince of Jerusalem? Who are we talking about? Zedekiah, right? Uh, and he says, <clears throat> verse 11, Say, I am assigned to you as I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. <clears throat> they shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. He shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will also spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. Somewhat of an odd saying from Jeremiah, or excuse me, from Ezekiel. <clears throat> Obviously signifying what was going to happen to Zedekiah, if you know the story. His eyes being put out and led into captivity. Uh, but at this point, they, went, they didn't know what was going to happen to Zedekiah. Uh, but Ezekiel was representing this by covering his eyes, saying that he wasn't going to see this land, um, but he was going to die there in verse 13. And then he, if you jump down to verses 15 and 16, notice what the Lord says. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, from famine, and from pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. 
So God's telling uh, all these things, keep in mind, uh, to Ezekiel. Where was Ezekiel prophesying? We've looked at on our map. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. Daniel was, where was Daniel? Daniel was in Babylon, and Ezekiel was in, next to the river Chebar, or Chebar, however you say it, among the common people, right? Uh, prophesying among the captives. So Ezekiel is doing all of these things for the captives who are already in captivity. Seems kind of odd. Uh, but nonetheless, God wanted these people to know that Jerusalem and that Judah was going to be entirely destroyed, entirely taken captive. That Zedekiah, their, the current king in Judah, was not going to succeed, but everything that God had prophesied concerning captivity was going to be fully carried out. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, it's important for us to remember that Ezekiel is prophesying about these things many miles away from uh, Jerusalem. And it's also important to note, and Bob points this out in the book, this is about three years before the Chaldean army comes in to besiege Jerusalem. So this is, you know, I mean, not a long time, but three years, a good bit of time, a decent amount of time. Uh, before this takes place. I wanted to make a comment here on what we read in verses 15 through 16, when the Lord says, they shall know that I am the Lord. What do you think it is about the captivity, uh, God taking the rest of the captives of Judah um, as he's signifying through what Ezekiel does here in chapter 12? What do you think it is about that that's going to, to allow the people to know that God is the Lord, that he is God? What is it about God that they're going to know? Maybe I didn't ask that question clear, clearly. But any ideas? Right, that God, God means what he says, right? that God is in control. Um, those are two things that, I've, that I had. God means what he says and that he's in charge, okay? God's going to do what he told the people he was going to do from the beginning, okay? They're going to know that he is Lord. And no matter the efforts that they take to stop this captivity or the messages that they're believing from false prophets that it's not going to be carried out, God is going to show them He's the one that's in charge and that it's his word that is going to be fulfilled. All right. So we kind of skip in the book uh, over chapters 13 through 23, and jump into chapter 24 and the 10th day, the 10th month and the ninth year. Uh, this would have been in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign. Okay. Um, Bob points out that the message of Ezekiel 24 really fits right in with sections one, uh, the chapters 1 through 24, this whole section of Ezekiel, um, which would be God's reasons for destroying Judah. God listing these reasons, and 24 really falls uh, right in with that. And chapter 24 is when uh, Nebuchadnezzar begins his siege on Jerusalem. We read that, I think we've showed this on our timeline before, but in 580, 588 BC, that's when the siege begins. And we read that in 2 Kings 25, 1, 2 Chronicles 36, 17, Jeremiah 39, 1, and 52, 4. So uh, you see the uh, continuity or the um, agreement of all these passages here of Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and, and 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But again, kind of all over the place there. With, with our timeline. Um, so shortly after this, we see uh, this question from Zedekiah, jumping over from Ezekiel to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 21. Jeremiah 21.
So Zephaniah, or excuse me, um, Zedekiah comes to um, Jeremiah, and he says in verse 2, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. And then he responds in verse 4, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, with which, uh, with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. So Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah asking him, you know, please inquire of God to save us from, from Nebuchadnezzar. And what is God's response? Not only am I not going to deliver you, I'm going to be against you, right? And he says that in verses 4 through 6. I'm going to take the very weapons that are in your hands and use them for Babylon. A pretty strong message there from the Lord. If you go down to verses 8 through 10, listen to what we read here. Now you shall say to this people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. God's still giving them an opportunity here. He who remains in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be as a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. So God's still giving them an opportunity to live, right? Uh, allow, or telling them, if you just submit to Nebuchadnezzar, if you go into captivity, you will live. You'll have this opportunity to be saved. But don't by any means think that I'm going to save this city. I'm going to destroy it. He says, I've set my face against this city. What do you think it is about verses 8 through 10 that we could, uh, a lesson maybe that we could learn in God's uh, proposal to the people of Jerusalem? Yeah, that's what I, that's exactly what I was thinking. Submission. Um, not trying to make our own way, but learning to do exactly what God says and to trust that. Um, uh, whatever the con consequences are. Um, but usually, if we do submit to him, uh, the consequences are going to be much better uh, than if we don't. And that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, if they didn't submit, he says, that's frankly the way of death. Uh, but, but had they submitted, they would have chosen the way of life. So God's giving this op opportunity for them to submit, to willingly submit to his will or to die in rebellion against it. All right, so this is going on in Jeremiah chapter 21. In Ezekiel chapter 24, we'll go back to chapter 24. Again, this is the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. I want to look at several verses. I have quite a few up here, <laughs> as you can see. Um, I wanted to try to get sections of this without reading the whole chapter, but I mean, it almost looks like we're going to read the whole chapter. But um, just to kind of set up the story of what's going on in Ezekiel 24, God uses this illustration of Jerusalem as a cauldron. And he says, uh, notice again in verse 1, it's the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day. Okay, he says, Son of man, write down the name of the day this very day. The king of Babylon started his siege against Jerusalem this very day. Okay, so the siege is started in verse, according to verse 2. And utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, put on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather pieces of meat in it, every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice cuts, take the choice of the flock, also pile fuel bones under it, make it boil well, and let the cuts simmer in it. And in verse 6 he says, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is in it, and whose scum is not gone from it. Bring it out piece by piece on which no lot 
has fallen. In verses 9 through 10, we kind of see a description of what, what, what this is, um, how God is uh, illustrating the people here. Uh, Woe to the bloody city. I too will make the pyre great, heap on the wood, kindle the fire, cook the meat well, mix in the spices, and let the cuts be burned up. Verse 12, she has grown weary with lies, and her great scum has not gone from her. Let her scum be in the fire. And your filthiness is lewdness, because I have cleansed you, and you were not cleansed. You will not be cleansed of your filthiness anymore, to have caused my fury to rest upon you. In verses 15 through 17, he says, Also the word of the Lord, uh, well, well, we'll read that here in a second, because that's kind of a different story there. So what is the illustration that God's going with with this cauldron? How, how is God illustrating the people here in Ezekiel 24? What's that? Yeah, about to be burned up, boiled, um, taking all those filth. He says, uh, your filthiness, what did he say? Verse 6, whose scum is in it, okay? And he says, uh, verse 13, uh, uh, or verse 12, um, she has not grown weary with lies, and her great scum has not gone from her. So all this nastiness, filthiness being boiled up, uh, and God uh, ultimately just burning up and boiling up the city is the illustration that we're getting. Um, pretty strong illustration, again, of the judgment that God is going to pronounce on Jerusalem. He moves from that illustration in chapter 24 to the illustration in, beginning in verse 15. In verses 15 through 17, it says, Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. Yet you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips. And do not eat man's bread of sorrow. So God tells Ezekiel, I'm going to take your wife away from you. And you're not allowed to mourn for her. Pretty hard commandment from God. Um, but Ezekiel does it nonetheless, ultimately to get a response from the people. He says in verse 19, and the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things signify to us that you behave so? And he says in verse 21, speak to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Hold, I will profane my sanctuary, your arrogant boast, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul, and your sons and daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips nor eat man's bread of sorrow. Your turbans shall be on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You shall neither mourn nor weep, but you shall pine away in your iniquities and mourn with one another. Thus Ezekiel is assigned to you. According to all that he has done, you shall do. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. Again, very harsh illustration of the loss that the people of Jerusalem are going to suffer in this judgment from God. The people that they love, their children, families, uh, dying by the sword, not even having an opportunity to mourn for them. All this stuff is happening back in Jerusalem. So I'm telling you, Ezekiel, all this stuff, and he's been way, way, miles and miles away. Over the mountain. And he's they're getting at all state. All vision knew of what's going on back in Jerusalem. Through what's God said in Ezekiel, and he's playing it out almost point by point by point of what's happening back in Jerusalem. They don't know. They're off in captivity already. This group here is ridiculous there. But everything that's happening back in Jerusalem is just about to cave in and fall and be burned. They're getting out of some bird's eye views on a different thing when God sent his dick at all this stuff. He's played it out. He's not these by these. So they know it. What's going on back in Jerusalem. And that's their own town. They're, they're concerned about it. Right. God has been doing all this until Thursday. 
right? Uh, Mr. Holtz just say that uh, what, they're, what they are getting, the message that they're getting here is, again, as we, we pointed out earlier, uh, these people are in captivity, okay? So what they're seeing is like a bird's eye view. You said television view. It's like they're seeing a live view of what's going to be happening to the people that are back in Jerusalem. Um, probably people that they knew, right? Uh, maybe even family, family uh, of the people that were already in captivity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important for us to keep that perspective in mind too, um, that these people are still, these people are already in captivity and they're seeing this uh, from afar. Um, I want to read real quickly verses 25 through 27. Uh, he says, and you said of men, will it not be in the day when I take from them their stronghold, uh, their joy and their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that on which they set their minds, their sons and their daughters. On that day, one who escapes will come to you to let you hear it with your ears. On that day, your mouth will be open to them who has escaped. You shall speak and no longer be mute. Thus you, thus you will be assigned to them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Um, in chapter 3, verses 26, 26 through 27, uh, God had told, if you want to just quickly turn there, um, God had told Ezekiel, I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and not be one to rebuke them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. So God basically told Ezekiel in chapter 3, you're only going to speak what I tell you to speak. I'm not going to be rebuking this people. Um, so according to chapter 3, verse 26 to 27, up until this point, Ezekiel has only spoken to the people what God has revealed to him. Um, and then God said in chapter 24, verses uh, 26 or 25 to 27, that he was going to eventually loosen his tongue. He won't, wouldn't be mute anymore. Um, but I just wanted to point that out, uh, point that out. Uh, Bob pointed it out in the book uh, that this is what has been going on with Ezekiel. All right, so jumping uh, from Ezekiel 24 um, and still kind of going along with our timeline, the siege of Jerusalem had began in 588 B.C., and then according to Jeremiah chapter 37 and verse 5, the Babylonians broke off their siege from Jerusalem to fight against the Egyptians. The Egyptians uh, came up against the Babylonians. The Babylonians had their, uh, the cities of Lachish um, and Jerusalem and Asika sieged. And uh, the, the idea here is that they pulled all their troops away from these cities to fight the Egyptians to deal with that and then come back. And in Jeremiah 37, uh, God addresses this with um, Zedekiah. Verses 1 through 3, King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord, which he spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. Um, and Zedekiah the king sent Je Jehuchal the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah the son of Messiah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah was coming, going among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison. Then Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Okay, so taking their siege away from Jerusalem to deal with these Egyptians. And then... Jeremiah speaks to Zedekiah. He says, The word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help you, uh, will return to Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. God didn't want Zedekiah to get his hopes up, right? Just because the, the Egyptians had held off the Babylonians for a time, he didn't want Zedekiah to think, maybe we're free. Maybe the Babylonians are gone forever. Maybe the Egyptians are going to save us, right? Uh, as he has had put his trust in them before. And it says in verse 9, 
Do not deceive yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. For though you have defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remained only wounded men among them, they would rise up, every man in his tent, and burn the city with fire. Again, very strong language from God here on uh, his intent to destroy the city of Jerusalem, to punish Jerusalem. Uh, even, if, even if you destroyed the whole army and it was all wounded men, they would still defeat this city is what God says to them. Pretty strong language there. But again, it illustrates to us God's mind and focus on punishing the people. Just a couple lessons here um, in looking at this text that I thought were, were practical. Um, in verses 1 through 3, we read that Zedekiah asked for a message from, uh, from Jeremiah. What is, Jeremiah, what is Zedekiah's typical response to the message of Jeremiah? Is it favorable? Is he usually wanting to hear what Jeremiah says? You know, the interesting thing about Zedekiah is that he doesn't accept what Jeremiah and what God is telling him, but he still keeps coming to Jeremiah to ask what's going to happen. It, it made me think about us sometimes. I think sometimes we have this attitude. Uh, we know we need to ask God. We know we need to inquire of God. But when we go to his word and we find answers, we don't accept those answers. We don't accept what we need to do, right? Zedekiah didn't accept what he needed to do uh, in response to what God told him to do. I thought that was a pretty practical lesson for us. If we're inquiring of God, if we're praying about something, and we're going to his word looking for answers, but we're not accepting that answer and doing something about it, we're just as bad as Zedekiah. We're making the same mistake. Um, What he wanted to hear, he would have done. Exactly. That's exactly right. Had Jeremiah told him what he wanted to hear, absolutely he would have done it, right? Uh, but that, that's the issue. How do we accept when we don't want to hear from God? How do we accept that? Um, another thing from these verses I thought was practical, and just real quickly, um, as we read in verses 5 through 10, God's will is going to be done even if we think that... Uh, you know, as Zedekiah thought, um, that there's no sign of it being accomplished. God's will is going to be done. Um, and you could apply that to, to multiple aspects of life, but possibly the return of Jesus. You know, may, no signs of it, right, uh, that we're seeing, but it's going to be done. Uh, and then lastly, uh, something that I noticed here from Jeremiah uh, 37, verses 16 through 17. Um, Bob kind of goes through this story in the book. Uh, Jeremiah proclaims the word of the Lord in verse 15. The princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him, put him in prison. And then Jeremiah, he goes into the dungeon, and then Zedekiah sent to him. And then he says, is there any word from the Lord? Verse 17, same chapter asking again, what is God telling you? And Jeremiah said, there is. Then he said, you shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah didn't change his message, even though Zedekiah kept coming back to him. Even though Zedekiah had the power and authority to release him from this dungeon, Jeremiah uh, says, you're going to be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Um, so he doesn't change his message. He continues to proclaim the truth in spite of the difficulties that he's facing. All right. So the Chaldeans pull their uh, siege away from Jerusalem. They go back. Uh, they win this victory over Egypt, and they are soon back in Judah and in Jerusalem. I mentioned how they were also uh, had Lachish and Asika under siege, Jeremiah 34, 1 through 7. Um, Verse, let's read verse 7. Uh, when the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah that were left against Lachish and Azekah, for only these fortified cities remained of the cities of Judah. Three cities, right? Three cities. 
Ju uh, Jerusalem, Lachish, and Asika. Lachish and Asika are soon defeated. Jerusalem's left alone. Um, so this is going on in Jeremiah um, with our timeline here. Also, Ezekiel 25 through 32. Uh, while all this is going on with, uh, with Jerusalem and Jeremiah's prophesying these things, um, Ezekiel is prophesying uh, in, in Ezekiel 25 through 32, uh, most of around the same time, right? Mostly during and immediately after the siege of Jerusalem. So just to help you kind of get an idea of the timeline, what's going on with Ezekiel while this is going on in Jerusalem and with Jeremiah. So concerning these prophecies from Ezekiel and Ezekiel 25 through 32, which are against the nations that are surrounding Judah. Again, keep in mind, the people that are hearing this are in captivity. This isn't the people in Jerusalem. But what would have, what do you think God would have wanted them to take away prophecies against the ending Jerusalem? What do you think he would have gotten, wanted his people to take away from that? Who had they been relying on, according to what we read in Jeremiah 37? Egypt? Right. Yeah, they had been relying on Egypt. Egypt actually gave a glimmer of hope for them uh, by, by pulling Babylon away. Um, but ultimately, God prophesies against the surrounding nations, and mostly in Ezekiel, uh, I think it's 29, chapters 29 through 32, against Egypt itself, showing the people, you can't rely on other nations. You need to rely on me, really, uh, ultimately. Uh, but that, that would have been an important message or important lesson for them to, to take away from these prophecies against the surrounding nations, that they needed to rely on God for deliverance and not on... This, these other nations. All right. In 580, beginning in 587 BC, about uh, several events and visions and prophecies from Jeremiah and Ezekiel take place. Uh, this would have been the 10th year of Zedekiah. In Jeremiah 32, um, Jeremiah buys this field from his cousin. Okay. Uh, in verse 7, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you saying, Buy my field, which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So, so Jeremiah buys this field. And then in verse 15, says, for, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Signifying, again, even though God was going to destroy Jerusalem, he was going to bring a remnant back. He was going to bring his people back. Um, and allow them to repossess the land. Um, in verses 21 through 24, I want to read this real quickly. Listen to what Jeremiah says. He says this prayer beginning in verse 16 and ending in verse 25. But listen to 21 through 24. He says, You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, and with great terror. You have given them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and took possession of it, but they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. Look, the siege mounds. They have come to the city to take it, and the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword and famine and pestilence. What you have spoken has happened. There you see it. Jeremiah, in this prayer, uh, taking responsibility for the people, uh, for the sins that they've committed that has brought all of this upon them. Uh, I wanted to, to note that because I, I think that's uh, uh, important for us to note that Jeremiah at least uh, recognized the reason that all of this was happening because of the sins of the people. As he said very explicitly in verse 23, they have done nothing of all that you've commanded them to do. Um, 
And then in uh, verses 26 through 44, God continues to reassure the people and reassure Jeremiah that they would be able to come back into this land and take it. And he says in um, verse 36, now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. I will bring them back to this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the God of them, or excuse me, for the good of them, and their children after them. And then in verse 43, uh, kind of going back to Jeremiah buying the field, he says, and fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. So again, God explicitly saying in verses 36 to 39, his plan for bringing that back, this remnant that would be faithful, for, uh, faithful to him, would have this one heart. And again, verse 38, being his people, and him being their God, the ultimate plan that God had for his people, the relationship that he wanted with them. Right. Right. Verse 40, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Um, I was having a hard time narrowing down what verses I wanted to read because pretty much that whole section is beautiful. Uh, of, of God's uh, description of the relationship he was going to have with his people again. All right. Going over to Jeremiah chapter 38 real quickly. We see the story of Jeremiah being put again into this pit, uh, in this mire. And uh, he's been telling Again, prophesying, the princes get mad. They come to Zedekiah and say, listen to the message that Jeremiah is telling. And so Jeremiah says, or excuse me, Zedekiah says, I'm putting him into your hands. You do with him what you want. So they throw him in this pit, and he's in this miry pit. And then um, uh, Malchiah, in verse 6, comes to Zedekiah and says, he's going to die. He's going to die there because we don't have any bread in the city, and he's sitting here in this pit. So Zedekiah says to him, all right, well, you do with him what you want. Zedekiah seems really be indifferent about what's happening to Jeremiah. But nonetheless, Melchiah comes and uh, lowers these ropes for him to put under his, his arms, and he pulls him out of the pit. Um, and then we see God's response in chapter 39 to what Melchiah did for him. Um, he says, or excuse me, it's not Melchiah, it's Ebed-Melech. Uh, and he says in verse 17, I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid, for I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be a surprise to you because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. So uh, I apologize for that. It's Ebed-Melech who came in and saved uh, Jeremiah. Um, but God says he's going to save Ebed-Melech from the destruction of, of the people of Babylon. Uh, because he says, you've put your trust in me. How do you think it is that Ibn Melek put his trust in, in the Lord? I thought that was kind of an interesting way uh, for God to phrase this. Maybe there were, maybe there were other ways in which he did it. Um, uh, if nothing else, we do see very directly his respect for the prophet of God, right? Um, it seems like Ibn Melek had respect for the prophet of God, which I think in, in, in turn would mean respect for the messages from God, the, the word of the Lord, right? Um, so maybe that's a roundabout way to interpret this, um, but nonetheless, we do see uh, a respect from Ebed-Melech for Jeremiah and in turn for the word of the Lord. Right. Right, right, absolutely. Right, 
which comes back to that lesson of submission, right? Okay. So in chapters 29 through 32, I mentioned how Ezekiel specifically prophesies against Egypt, who Jerusalem was really trying to put their trust in. 586 B.C., 11th year of Zedekiah. This is months and weeks leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, there was no date given to that story we just talked about in Jeremiah 38, Jeremiah being put into the pit, but most likely uh, immediately preceding the fall of Jerusalem because there was no bread in the city, um, as he mentioned, Ibn Melech had mentioned. In the 11th year, the first month, the first day, we see the prophecy against Tyre in Ezekiel 26. It's in 586 B.C. And then one week later, in the 11th year, first month, seventh day, this was about three months before the wall of Jerusalem was breached, we see um, in Ezekiel 30, the prophecy against Egypt, how God says he's going to strengthen Nebuchadnezzar against them. And then about two months later, in the 11th year, third month, first day of the month, this is about five weeks before Jerusalem's fall, Ezekiel 31, prophecy from Ezekiel 31 takes place. And God's telling Pharaoh, you should have learned from, from the Assyrians, right? Should have been warned by the Assyrian fate. And I don't know if I accidentally turned that off or not. Um, and then lastly, uh, no, that was the last one. That was my last slide. I wasn't looking at my notes. I was just looking at the slides. <laughs> All right. Any comments or questions for me in here? All right. Thank you for your attention.